Hey everyone, welcome to episode 6 of The Power of Bold. What's up, everyone? Thanks for tuning in to The Power of Bold. I'm your host, Adam Pascarella, and I'm really excited that you're here with me today. And I'm also very excited for all of the new listeners out there. Thank you so much for listening. I hope that you've taken some of the insights that we've spoken about in the first five episodes, and I hope that you've applied them to your own life. And that was and continues to be the point of this podcast. It's easy to talk about lots of these things, and it's much more difficult to execute. I struggle with this even to this day, so working together, I hope that we can continue to execute on accomplishing our goals and our dreams. That said, if you need any help or encouragement on fighting any fear that you're facing in order to accomplish your career goals, I really invite you to reach out to me. You can reach me on Twitter at at APASCAR, that's A-P-A-S-C-A-R, or you can email me at adam at thepowerofbolt.com. In the last episode of the podcast, I spoke with Devin Martin, who's a life coach based in New York City. And Devin has a pretty awesome story, and he gave some really good advice for those looking to leave their jobs to start a business. So if you haven't listened to it yet, I really encourage you to check it out. In this episode, I'm going to take a step back and talk about something that I've thought about for quite some time, and that's startup ideas. This episode is more focused on those who are looking to leave their jobs and start a business, But even if you aren't planning on doing this, you can pick up some really good tips that can help you identify opportunities to become entrepreneurs in your current job. With that said, let's jump right in. Back in 2010, I graduated college from the University of Michigan and traveled to Egypt to participate in an intensive Arabic summer program. While in Cairo, I happened to come across a Virgin megastore and picked up Richard Branson's book, Losing My Virginity. After conversing in Arabic all day, I would read Branson's book before I went to sleep, and by doing this, I became more and more enamored with starting a business. I thought it would be really interesting to envision something and put it out into the world. Not only would it be awesome to create a product or service that makes a difference in people's lives, but I also acknowledge the potential monetary rewards. I would daydream about starting something, but I would always get hung up on the idea There were points where I would become excited about a potential idea, but then the interest would fade. I would get discouraged or think that there was some better startup idea around the corner, and that I would just need to keep working in order to find it. Now, this happened on and off again for quite some time, almost several years. Looking back now, there are a number of things that would have changed when going about this process of discovering a startup idea. So this episode is not only about ways to generate these startup ideas, but it's also about something arguably more important, and that is execution. I've read so much on this topic, whether it's the process of actually generating an idea or vetting your ideas, so I feel pretty comfortable talking about this. I'll also note several articles which really helped me with this process, and I'll post links to those articles in the show notes. I'm going to give a broad overview of idea generation, and then talk about some of the articles and essays that really helped me, And then I'll discuss some actionable insights that you can take when you're in the idea generation phase. Before we start with any of this, I want to discuss something that is often talked about in the startup world, and that's whether ideas actually matter. The ultimate point of the con group of this debate is that execution matters over even the best idea. And I think this is true. Execution is critically important. But I also think that the idea is at times underrated. It helps to enter a market with a rising tide, so to speak, where you have a unique spin or take on ways to provide value. A rising tide today would be cryptocurrencies or artificial intelligence, for example. It's so much easier to create a startup or have a startup idea in a market that's growing rapidly compared to a market that's stagnant. Sam Altman from Y Combinator, the renowned startup accelerator, discusses this point in a recent lecture in a startup school series at Stanford University. You can find this on YouTube, and I'll definitely link to it in the show notes. So really, I don't think this discussion about ideas or execution is moot. Execution is critical, 
and without it, any idea that you have won't matter. But having said that, ideas do matter, and it's important to think about them before starting your startup adventure. We're going to spend the episode talking about the idea generation process, but I think it's important to keep this debate in mind. Now let's begin with a general premise. People start startups because they have a problem that is calling them so much that they have no other option but to solve it by creating a company, or they simply want to start a startup, hoping that they'll find some grand idea later. Much of the advice out there says that the former is much better than the latter, but I don't think the latter is necessarily that bad. You just have to be more disciplined in creating and vetting your ideas. This is easier said than done, however, so I think it's much more likely that you'll succeed if you organically come across a problem that you want to work on. And before we get any further, I want to mention an essay that is really the Bible to developing startup ideas. It's Paul Graham's essay called How to Get Startup Ideas, and this is from November 2012. For those of you who don't know, Paul Graham is most well known for starting Y Combinator, which I just mentioned a couple minutes ago. It's the most well-known startup incubator in the United States, let alone the world. Paul Graham and Y Combinator gave advice and helped scale notable startups, including Reddit, Airbnb, and Dropbox. He's really one of the most well-known luminaries in Silicon Valley, and has seen startups from their founding to their IPO. So his advice is really well-respected, and I think this essay on startup ideas is the gold standard. In order to get the full impact of this episode, I would almost require you to read it. I don't want to just summarize the essay since I can't speak about it as well as Graham, but we can use his essay as a baseline and as a starting point as we go about discussing idea generation. I think the article is so important I could go on and on about it, but I just want to mention the main thesis of the article. And Graham says that the best startup ideas are something that first, the founders want, second, something that they can build, and third, something that few others realize are worth doing. He says that Microsoft, Google, Apple, Yahoo, and Facebook were started this way. So looking at the first prong, something that the founders want, this seems pretty clear. It ensures that the problem exists, and the worst problem in creating a startup is creating something that people don't want. In fact, Y Combinator's motto is, make something people want. It's so important. Without this leg of the stool, you really have no chance. So the best way of finding something that people want is creating something that you'd want. The assumption is that others would want to have it too. And this is just an assumption, you'll have to test it later on. Along with this, you want to find something that few people massively want, rather than something that many people kind of want. You're looking for passion at the beginning. Ambivalence is a death knell for early startups. You'll know you're onto something if you can get many passionate initial users you're essentially on your way to finding product market fit. The next prong is something that you can build. And again, this seems pretty obvious on the surface. It goes again to the execution idea. Ideas are worthless without execution. I don't think you have to have all of the skills that you need to build the entire product that you envision right away, but you need to have some sort of way to test the baseline assumptions of your idea, even if you're non-technical. And that could be either by creating a wireframe or even just describing your idea to friends or family or even potential customers. Finding a co-founder, especially a technical co-founder, is an entirely different issue, and I hope to have a future episode on that. The final prong of Graham's test is identifying something that few others think are worth doing, and this is tougher. The skeptics always say, if your idea was such a good idea, why hasn't anyone else built it? It's hard to hear the haters say that. While it's true that large companies have access to many resources, it can't be the case that it's impossible to develop an idea that they haven't thought of yet. I think at this stage, it's important to follow your interests. If you're interested in a particular subject area, you'll naturally gravitate to learning more and more about it, and you'll eventually identify gaps. Time is also an important factor. Good startup ideas can take time and it becomes much harder to identify a solid idea when you're scrambling to find an idea. The more time you have to identify a problem that intrigues you, and a potential solution, the better off you'll be. Graham encapsulates this entire attitude in one phrase, live in the future and build what's missing. It's better to notice startups and fields that you're interested in, 
compared to sitting in a room and thinking about great startup ideas. He says the best approach to finding a good startup idea is indirect. And I'm going to quote from his essay here. He says that if you have the right sort of background, good startup ideas will seem obvious to you. But even then, not immediately. It takes time to come across situations where you notice something is missing. And often, these gaps won't seem to be ideas for companies, just things that would be interesting to build. Which is why it's good to have the time and the inclination to build things just because they're interesting. Again, it's critical to read the Graham essay, since it provides a roadmap to identifying startup ideas. But if you're at the way, way beginning of this process, I think there are two strategies to go about encountering startup ideas. You can find ideas from the top down or the bottom up. You can look at an industry that you're interested in and find opportunities there. Or you can just look at problems that you're facing in your life, regardless of the industry. As far as my so-called top-down approach, I'd first look at industries that you're interested in and look at those industries with the framework that Graham provided. You'd ask yourself, what are problems that I face? What is something that I can build? And what is something that big companies don't realize is worth doing? And with this top-down approach, I'd most obviously start with the industry where you currently work. Many great startup ideas come from what people noticed was broken or missing at their jobs, and they left to build a solution. As just one example, Michael Bloomberg got the spark of his idea for the Bloomberg Terminal when he was working for Solomon Brothers in New York City. And I can think of many startup ideas for when I was an associate at a large corporate law firm, and for instance, better legal research tools for junior associates. I'm sure you discuss problems at work with your family or friends. But instead of griping, I'd really recommend to take some time to think about how you would solve the problems that you come across. You could even speak with colleagues and how you would think about fixing it. And with this, you don't necessarily have to leave your company to start your own startup to solve this problem. You can become an entrepreneur. There may be some more red tape, but you have job security, and you can make a difference, especially at a company that you may love also the bottom-up way of thinking about startup ideas, and that is just identify any problem that you have in your life, and then you'll vet from there. I'd start with literally zero restrictions, so-called blue sky brainstorming. Don't think about whether it could be a big company or not. Just think about the most pressing problems that you have in your life today. It can be a quote-unquote big or small problem in your industry or not, or in an industry where you have some familiarity or not. Just stream of consciousness write down problems that you're facing in your life right now. They can be abstract or concrete. You'll vet later. Just ask yourself, damn, this is a problem that's really facing me right now. How can I solve it? Or ask, what do I wish someone would solve for me right now? Now these baseline questions will get you started. And like I said, you can vet your ideas later on. So besides the Graham way of thinking about things... I've consulted a bunch of other articles and books about how to generate startup ideas. And after doing this, I created a bunch of filters to help me think throughout this process. I'd recommend just considering some of these filters and using them as a starting point in light of the Graham criteria as I just described. And just to be clear, all of these filters are if you're struggling to come up with an idea. Just to reemphasize again, organic ideas are by far the best the ideas that just come to you because you're living in the future. But having said that, here are some filters and some provocative questions that have helped me when I feel stuck. First, is there anything that takes more than two minutes to do online? And if there is, can you develop a solution to solve the problem so that it can be done in less than two minutes? This is a framework that Kevin Ryan, a renowned New York City entrepreneur and investor, used to found Guild Group and Business Insider, among other companies. Second, what piece of marketplace information do people crave, yet don't have? Some startups that answer this question include Expedia, Zillow, and Glassdoor. Third, where can I bring liquidity to a locked-up asset? This is the idea of utilizing excess capacity in our lives. The ideas behind Airbnb, Uber, and Lyft, for example, touch on this idea, as well as many startups in the so-called sharing economy. Fourth, is there an analog, offline activity that many people are doing? And can it be brought online and be made a thousand times better? 
Some startups that leverage this idea include Pinterest, online scrapbooking, Instagram, photography, and Groupon for coupon clipping. Fifth, Steve Blank, a renowned investor and entrepreneur, created a framework for a billion-dollar startup. A billion-dollar startup solves a job and gets a job done for a customer, or it fulfills a human social need, like friendship, dating, sex, entertainment, art, communication, blogs, confession, networking, gambling, or religion. Do you see any openings in any of these human social needs to solve any pressing problems? And sixth, what are the top three problems in whatever field, and how could I fix them? You can also ask yourself, wouldn't it be nice or awesome if blank happened in your field or another industry that you're interested in? Now again, these are just starting points for your thinking. If you're hitting a wall when you're trying to notice any organic startup ideas, or if you're in a position where you need a startup idea right now, like if you recently left your job. If you come up with a potential idea using any of these filters, you'll have to be disciplined. You'll have to determine whether it's a real problem that you're having, whether you can execute, and whether a big company notices that it's a problem or not. So now I want to talk a little bit about vetting your ideas. It's easy to engage in blue sky idea generation. Anyone can do it. But proceeding from there can be difficult. You may question which idea should I choose, and this is where vetting comes into play. Now just to be clear, this doesn't have to be a huge monumental decision. It's so easy to launch cheap experiments, and as I'll talk about in a few minutes, it's better that you launch as soon as you reasonably can in order to validate your idea. But beyond that, when you have a list of potential ideas, how do you proceed? Here are a few things to consider. First, an idea may just be calling you. Sometimes you just know in your gut that you have to go after this idea. You go through your list multiple times and you just keep coming back to it. If that's the case, you should probably follow your gut and at least experiment with that idea. Second, you should ask what problem or need that you're addressing. And this is a big one. It may seem intuitive if you're the one with the need or problem, but I think it's worth thinking about the problem or need in greater detail. One framework that really helps me is the jobs to be done theory from Harvard Business School professor Clay Christensen. And essentially, you want to create a product or service that solves a so-called job for a customer or for a business. So the most simple example of this theory is that people don't want to purchase a quarter inch drill. They want to purchase a quarter inch hole. It's important to remember this insight. People are trying to make progress under varying circumstances and products that help people make that progress will win. Christensen says that there are functional, social, and emotional elements to every job that people face in their lives, and the best products are those that address all three elements. Christensen talks about his jobs to be done theory in a recent book called Competing Against Luck. It's a really insightful theory, and I'd highly recommend that you check it out. And perhaps I'll have another podcast episode solely on that theory. So beyond the jobs to be done theory, I'd also recommend that you look at the current market for those ideas in your shortlist. Simply put, you have to know the current state of the market, the economics of the market, and potential entry points. You need to know the market's history, what's worked and what hasn't worked, and how you can break into the market. Competitors often don't end up killing startups. It's often due to the startups themselves or through startup founders quitting. But it's still definitely important to look at the current market and who you may be competing against. It's even better if you can find some white space between you and your competitors. And to find this white space, I'd recommend doing a little analysis using Blue Ocean Strategy. Blue Ocean Strategy is a book by W. Chan Kim that helps you escape the so-called red waters of brutal competition and find the blue waters of competitive differentiation and so-called value innovation. The book includes examples of companies that have found blue oceans, including Cirque du Soleil and Yellowtail Wine. It's a really interesting book on how to separate yourself from competition. Most useful for us is that the book provides a so-called strategy canvas, where you can map out the most important elements in your market or industry, and how your company will differentiate itself from the pack. I found this framework super useful when further investigating ideas. So those are just three additional frameworks to help you vet ideas. 
the vetting process is very important, and I'd highly recommend that you spend a good amount of time thinking about it. But beyond this, I also want to mention a few additional things that you should be thinking about as you're going about this idea generation process. First, again, to reemphasize, you should notice a problem that you're facing. You may be the only person with the problem, but it's still better than trying to come up with a solution to a non-existent problem. As we discussed earlier, it's better to come across an idea in your life than sit in a room and try to think of a startup. It's easy to ignore problems that you're facing in the world, but for the purpose of this exercise, you must ignore this temptation. Really see what grinds your gears, and ask your friends and family if they notice anything that grinds your gears. You're bound to come up with some interesting insights. Second, there is this question of how much time you should allocate to the idea generation process. Now, this is a tough one if you're in the second camp of quitting your job in order to build a company. And how much time you spend on idea generation depends on your financial resources and your comfort with your idea flow. If you quit your job in order to start a startup and have a vague idea of what you want to do, but you would possibly consider others, you have to move quickly. There's some inherent danger in this, as you may choose an idea that seems great on the surface, but that has numerous challenges that you aren't seeing due to time constraints. And this is a serious problem that could jeopardize your startup's future even before it begins. Ultimately, you'll just need to execute and test as quickly as you can, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Now, if you haven't left your job, or if you have more time, you're in a great position. You have time to organically find startup ideas, which are the best kind. And like I said, when going about your day, really try to notice the problems that you're facing. Like Paul Graham says, live in the future through your habits and build what's missing. You can afford to be patient, so don't rush things. Now, the third additional insight I want to provide is a big one. And that is, you need to get behind the theory and the vague notion of startup ideas and get into reality as quickly as possible. I'm always reminded of the famous Mike Tyson quote. Just to paraphrase it, he says that everyone has a plan until they get hit in the mouth. To put it another way, it's increasingly rare for startup ideas to survive first contact with a customer. You'll need to take customer feedback and pivot your business accordingly. You should think of your startup idea as a thesis. It can be the most well-thought-out thesis, but it's still a thesis. It needs to be tested in the marketplace. The history of startups is full of famous pivots. You could look at Flickr, the photo-sharing site, which initially started as an online video game. You could look at Twitter, which was a side project launched out of Odeo, which was a podcasting directory. Or you could look at Groupon, which began as a startup called The Point, which was an activist website where people would only take action if commitment reached a tipping point. These are three examples, but there are countless others. And as Steve Blank notes, you need to get out of the building and talk with potential customers. You should launch, no matter how bad it looks, as quickly as possible. And this is because you need to validate the core assumptions of your idea. Whether that's through a landing page, a wireframe, a minimal viable product, whatever it is, you need to get your idea out of your head and into customers' hands. The idea can sound perfect in your mind, but you may be in store for rude awakening when you share it with others. And I'd say that when sharing your ideas with others, you need to look for honest feedback. This is so critical. It's easier to go to your parents or people that you know will affirm your idea. But this isn't going to pay off in the long run. You can start with friends that you know will give honest feedback. But beyond these initial conversations, you absolutely need to go out and talk with your potential customers. If you have a consumer startup idea, you need to talk to those most willing to buy your product, whether you find them on Reddit, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or some other social network where you can target specific consumers. And for an enterprise idea, you need to go to those potential customers See if you can get a meeting, or in the best case scenario, a letter of intent or commitment to purchase once your product is up and running. That's one of the best ways to validate your idea. There's also a book that talks about launching products and surveying potential customers. The book is called Validating Product Ideas by Tomer Sharon. It's really a great book that was recommended to me, and I'd highly recommend it if you're getting started and looking to identify potential customers. 
Now, along with this, when you're speaking with potential customers, I think there's some value of calling your idea an experiment. I think this is a critical point. It's a hedge if you're hesitant to share your idea with people. Instead of indicating that you're all in on this idea, which you actually may be, you can still say that you're trying to work things out, that this is all an experiment. For some reason, this tends to feel better. It works for me, and I hope it works for you. Reid Hoffman, the founder of LinkedIn and a famous venture capitalist, has the famous saying, if you're not embarrassed by the first version of your product, you're too late. I believe this is true, and this can be a struggle for people who work in a corporate environment where everything is triple-checked before production. As a startup, speed is your advantage. You need to leverage that, even at the early stages of your idea. So really, the idea stage is exciting. You can envision the future and envision success. The wheels may be churning so much that you may not be able to sleep, and instead you just keep envisioning the possibilities. This is awesome. It's really happened to me a lot. But having said that, ideas are just that. They're ideas. They're valueless. There isn't a marketplace for ideas. Ideas are inherently worthless without execution. As I've discovered, it's better to be fast and test an idea that ultimately fails then keep thinking of and perfecting an idea in your mind. Bad customer feedback is insanely better than no customer feedback. You should keep this in mind as you're going through the idea discovery process. You're just at the beginning of your journey, and it's incredibly exciting. I plan on having future episodes talk about the customer feedback process and how to test your ideas. But in the meantime, I think this is a great introduction to the topic, and will put you on a good path going forward. Thanks for tuning into this episode. I hope you enjoyed it and that you're inspired to notice startup ideas in your own life. If you have any questions about the content of this episode or anything at all, do not hesitate to reach out to me. You can reach me at Twitter, like I said, my handle is at APASCAR, or you can visit the Power of Bolt website, which is easy to remember, thepowerofbolt.com. The show notes will also be there. So thanks again and catch you next time.